Good morning to everyone. It is good to see you here, and I know that we're all thankful for the opportunity that we have to be together to worship our God. I want to encourage everyone, if you will, to open your Bibles up or to keep them open there at Luke chapter 10. We're going to talk today about the Good Samaritan. I know that this is a parable that is familiar to most of us, if not all of us, and yet there are some things that I hope that we can bring out in our study today that maybe we haven't thought of before and can help us to be the people God wants us to be and interact with one another, with our world, the way that our Lord would have us to interact. And so let's begin by going back to verse 25 because that's really where this context begins. Jesus had sent out his disciples on a limited commission and they have returned and have been able to tell him of the great things that they were able to do. And so he speaks to them in private. And evidently there was a man, a, a lawyer, the Bible calls him, who was present, who may have been listening to Jesus talking to his disciples. And he has a question for Jesus. Here's what we read beginning at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? most important question that anyone really could ever ask. But here is a man. He's called a a lawyer. Now, I want us to understand that he's not a lawyer like we think of lawyers today. He wasn't an expert in their civil law, but rather he was an expert in the law of Moses. Most likely he was a scribe who spent time copying God's word. He would have been a reader of God's Word. He would have been a teacher of God's Word. That's what they were referring to when they called someone a lawyer. And so this man comes to Jesus and he tests him or or tempts him here. Now, from verse 25, we really don't gain insight about the motive of this lawyer. Was he asking a sincere question or was he trying to entrap Jesus? We really don't see what his mindset was until we get a little later in this account. And what we're going to find is that this man was seeking to justify himself. So his motives might not have been as as pure as they ought to have been. But he asked Jesus this question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Think about that for a moment. It's easy to just kind of gloss over that. But by saying these things to this lawyer, Jesus brings a couple of ideas, important ideas, to our minds. First of all, he connects the idea of eternal life with what has been written. God has given us the answer. The answer to this question, what do I need to do to have eternal life, is found in the Word of God. And so Jesus says, what is written in the law? Secondly, by saying, how readest thou? Jesus is explaining to him and to all that there is a correct way or a proper way to interpret what God has given unto us. God didn't give us his word and then want everybody to come up with their own understanding. You hear that a lot today. Well, that's your interpretation. This is my interpretation. 
and we just go back and forth with whatever someone thinks or whatever they feel and, and whatever insight they think they have. No, Jesus was saying there is a proper way, a correct way to interpret what God has given to us. What's written in the law? How readest thou? That's where the answer is. So in verse 27, we find, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. We find Jesus saying something very similar to this when he was asked about what is the greatest commandment in the law. And here, this lawyer responds in a correct manner. He speaks of the, the vertical responsibility that we have unto God to obey his commandments, to love God with all our being. How do you demonstrate that love? Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And so by saying what he says here, he's absolutely right. We want eternal life. We have got to obey the will of God. But we also have a responsibility to one another. That horizontal response. Love your neighbor as yourself. John, the Apostle John, would write later about the kind of love that we're to have toward one another. And he would explain that if we don't love our brother whom we have seen, how can we say that we love God whom we've not seen? And so there is that relationship or responsibility to show this love toward one another. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. And when Jesus said this do, he said it in the present tense, which means this you keep on doing. This isn't a one-time thing. It's not something you did in the past. It's something you've got to keep on doing, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Then we get to verse 29. But he, that is the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? This idea of justifying himself carries with it the idea that this man wanted Jesus to agree with his understanding. This man who was a lawyer, most likely a scribe, most likely would have been identified with the Pharisees. And so this man considered only those who were in his group, his sect, those that were like him to be his neighbor. What he wanted Jesus to say is, you're doing it right. You, you understand. When you show kindness to those that are like you and... You don't have to to anyone else. You're, you're doing it right. This man came tempting Jesus, testing Jesus. But Jesus is going to turn this around. And the one who is going to be put to the test is the lawyer. To show what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself, he responds by giving us what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's look at it. Verse 30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, him, departed leaving him half dead. Here's someone who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Some critics of the Bible say Jesus didn't know anything about direction. Jericho is northeast of Jerusalem. How can you say you went down to Jericho from Jerusalem? Well, those who say that kind of thing have never traveled this road. It was a road that was about 17 miles in length. And in elevation, you went down from Jerusalem to Jericho about 4,000 feet. 
And so Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about when he said this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You always went down from Jerusalem no matter what direction you might be traveling. It was a journey that would take someone about six hours to make. And it was a dangerous road. Everyone knew that. You were told, don't travel alone. Evidently, this man did, and he suffered the consequences. Robbers attack him. They beat him. They strip him. They wound him. And there were several wounds that were inflicted upon this traveler. They take all that he has, including his garments, and they leave him there half dead. Verse 31 says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Here were Jewish men who were supposed to be known for their spirituality, a priest and a, a, a Levite. The priests were from the tribe of Levi, and they were the people that led others in worship. They were the ones who offered the sacrifice, who burnt the incense, who lit the lamps, who took care of the showbread. They were the ones who were entrusted with these sacred roles among the Jews. The Levites were the helpers of these priests. In days of old, they were the ones who would take down and then put up the tabernacle as it was being moved. They were the helpers under the priest. They were supposed to be spiritual examples as well. And yet both of these men see the one who is suffering and continue on their way. Verse 33 tells us, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. A Samaritan. Jews didn't think much of Samaritans. They were the people that lived in between the Jews that lived in Galilee in the north and the Jews that lived in Judea in the south. And right in the middle were the Samaritans. They began as a people when the Assyrians took away the northern tribes of Israel, left the very weakest of the people, and brought in people from other nations. It wasn't long until they began to intermarry, have children, and they become a people unto themselves, taking the name of the capital city of that area so that it's known as Samaria, the Samaritans. And because the Jews saw them as not being truly Israelites, they grew to despise them. I know that we have trouble with racism in our world for all different kinds of reasons, but I imagine that what existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, it was even greater than what we have in our world today. There was such hatred. One of the greatest insults that a Jew could give to anyone was to say, you are a Samaritan. And you remember, that's what they called Jesus. This Samaritan. Perhaps one of the most unlikely people to show compassion is the one who sees the man in need and cares for him. Verse 34 says, This Samaritan went to him and bound up his wounds. It's plural. He, he had several wounds upon him. Pouring in oil and wine, most likely olive oil. And this would have mollified and purified the wounds, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, 
He took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, we don't talk about our money in pence or denarii today. But what you need to understand is that a pence or a denarius was equal to a day's wages. So whatever you make in a day, you double that. He gave two pence, two denarii, unto the innkeeper. So whatever you make in two days. And he says, this is for him. He knew that he was going to take several weeks to recover. He was paying for what this man would need. And if you need anything extra, you take care of that. In that day, to stay at an inn, the price was about one-twelfth of a denarius. And so what he pays for is for this man to stay more than three weeks. You put that in our kind of money today. You're talking a couple thousand dollars. That's what he gave for the care of this individual. And then he says, if he needs anything more, you give it to him and I will repay it when I return. So Jesus, the one who had been tempted by the lawyer, turns the table. And he says, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Jesus teaches us about who our neighbor really is. Now, with the rest of our lesson, I, I want to share three thoughts that I believe come from this encounter and the parable that Jesus taught on this occasion. He, here's the first thing that I want us to consider. And that is the answer is in the Word of God. Remember when we started, you had this lawyer asking the question, what must or what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what is written in the law? He connects the answer with what God has given us in Scripture. And folks, that is still the case today. The answer is still in the Word of God. What do I need to do to have eternal life? Where should we turn? If we turn to men, we're going to get all different kinds of answers. Some might say, you just pray and you will, you will be saved. You'll have eternal life. Some say, you just be a good person and you will have eternal life. Some say, you have got to confess or you have got to just believe and that's all you need to do. You've got to accept him as your personal savior. That's what you've got to do. You get as many answers as people you ask, perhaps. But if we want to know what God thinks, what He would have us to do, what we need to do is what Jesus told this man to do. What, what's written in the Scriptures? And you know what God would have us to do? It's the same for every individual. That man lived under the old covenant. That's why Jesus gave him the answer that he did. Today, we live under the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And throughout the scriptures, we have examples of people obeying the gospel. And folks, what they did to become Christians, to have eternal life, is exactly what we must do as well. Here in Acts chapter 8, you have one of those examples. Philip teaching the Ethiopian nobleman. There at verse 36, we're told, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. 
And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Here this penitent believer confesses his faith and is baptized into Christ for the remission of his sins. What is written in God's Word? The answer, my friends, is still in the Scriptures. Now here's the second thought I want us to consider. And this comes to us as we look at the individuals that Jesus talks about in this parable. I want us to consider the three rules of human relationships. And the, they are these. The iron rule, the silver rule, and the golden rule. Let's talk about them for a moment. The iron rule. That iron rule really says might makes right. One can do what he or she is big enough to do. And every aggressor who by force has tried to impose his will or her will on others to get what they want has lived by this rule. Now I realize that most people would say, oh no, no, we don't, we don't live that way. That, that's not the way that we conduct ourselves. But so often we find ourselves doing that. I'm big, you're little. We're doing it my way. And there are countries that live that way. There are households that are governed that way. It's this iron rule. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this little saying. I believe it's Latin. And you see it on t-shirts every now and then. Vini, vidi, vici. It was said by Caesar after one of his victories. And what it means is, I came, I saw, I conquered. And there's so many people that live their lives that way. Look at this statement. I wanted to share this with us. It says, with savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated. And those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. We civilized men, on the other hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. We institute poor laws, and our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. There is reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who from a weak constitution would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. Thus, the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Those are the words of a fellow named Charles Darwin. Anybody ever heard of him? Folks, there's a reason evolutionists don't build hospitals. They're built in the name of Christianity. Because evolutionists say, survival of the fittest. We need to get rid of the weak. That, that's the iron rule. And folks, that's what the robbers lived by. They took what they wanted because they could. And they left that individual half dead. Second is the silver rule. And that silver rule may sound similar or, or familiar to us. It says, what you do not wish done to you, do not do to others. And that was really the, what we see the priest and the Levite doing. They didn't do anything to that man. They didn't beat him. They didn't rob him. They didn't, they, they, they didn't do anything. Their mindset was, that's not my problem. I, I'm not going to get involved. And many people think that's a good way to live your life. You don't do to others what you don't do or want done to yourself. 
And to a lot of folks, that sounds okay. There was a case in 1964. I know that's a long time ago. As you guys born, I know it's a long time ago. But in 1964 in New York City, there was a woman by the name of Catherine Genovese. She was robbed and beaten and stabbed several times outside her apartment complex. She was left there and she was screaming for help. And no one came to her assistance. The man who had robbed her and stabbed her came back later and finished the job. He, he killed her. And when police were doing their investigation, they spoke to people in that apartment complex. And 38 of them had seen her on the ground, had heard her cries, and not one of them came to her aid. Not even one of them called the police. Now, folks, according to this silver rule, that's okay. They weren't the ones that stabbed her. They didn't do anything. They didn't rob her. Wasn't their problem. That was the priest and the Levite. And Jesus says that's not okay. And then there is this golden rule. And it's what Jesus would teach us. It's what's followed by the Samaritan. It says that you do unto others what you would have done unto you. And folks, that's scripture. That, that's Matthew 7 and verse 12 where Jesus says, Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, so often the world says, Whatever you do to me, that's what I'll do to you. If you're good to me, I will be good to you. But if you're wicked to me, I can give it right back. And the world feels justified in that. That's not what this says. This says, I'm going to treat my fellow man like I want to be treated. There's nothing in here about how he responds, what they do to me. Jesus lived this way. He showed us how to live this way. And the Samaritan who showed kindness and concern lived this way. The iron rule, the robbers lived by it. The silver rule, the priest and the Levite lived by it. The golden rule is seen in the Samaritan. There's one more thought I want us to think about as we consider what Jesus gives us here in this parable, and that is this, every person is my neighbor. Every person is my neighbor. That lawyer wanted to justify himself. He wanted Jesus to say, you're doing it right. When you show kindness to people that are just like you, that are in your group, and, and you don't have to to anyone else. You're, you're doing it right. But Jesus didn't tell him that. Jesus taught this parable where a Samaritan shows compassion toward one who is a Jew. And in doing so, he reminds us that every person is my neighbor. Doesn't matter what shade their skin may be. Doesn't matter what part of the world they might be from. It doesn't matter their level of education or where they are as far as money goes. None of that matters. We are neighbors to one another. This past year in particular, we, we've had a lot of troubles in our country, in our world, as far as race goes. And so we come up with these ideas, man does, to try to make things better. Folks, we're never going to get it right until we do it God's way. You can say amen when you want to. We're never going to get it right until we do it God's way and we see each other the way God intends us to see one another, that every man is my neighbor. 
because all are made in the image of God. Genesis 1 and verses 26 and 27. Every person has a soul. Every person is a spirit. We're made in the image of God. And then all are in need of compassion. That's what this Samaritan showed. He had compassion on him. And so often through the ministry of Jesus, you see that idea. Here's one example in Matthew 9 and verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Jesus looked at his fellow man with compassion. That's how we need to look toward one another. Someone who is made in the image of God. Someone that I need to demonstrate compassion unto. We all need it. But we all need something else. We all need the gospel. The Apostle Paul understood that. That's why this Jewish man was willing to go everywhere with the gospel. To preach it to everyone. Because he knew every soul, every person made in the image of God needed the gospel. In Romans 1 and verses 14 and 15, he's going to write, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Do we owe a debt to our fellow man? Christians? Absolutely. And the debt that we owe is the opportunity for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because every person needs it. We need to look at people the way that God wants us to, the way that Jesus teaches us to, understanding that every person is my neighbor made in the image of God, needs compassion, needs the gospel. And so you look at this parable. it's, It's familiar. And I hope that it will stay familiar in our minds. But I hope also as you think about the things that we've studied this morning, you'll remember these thoughts as well. That the answer is still in the word of God. That's where we go to learn what God would have us to do to have eternal life. We've seen the three rules of human relationships and we're determined we're going to live the way Christ wants us to by what we call the golden rule. And we understand that every person is my neighbor, made in the image of God, in need of compassion, in need of the gospel of Christ. Jesus shared these things because he wanted people to live godly lives. Because he knows that it's only by living the way God wants us to that we can have eternal life. We've got to do what his word teaches. We looked at an example today of one who heard the word, believed that word, repented of sin, confessed Christ, and then was immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you haven't done that, today's the day to take advantage of the opportunity the Lord has given to you. And if you're one who has obeyed but you've fallen away and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. I hope you'll think about these things. It's heaven's invitation. And if you're subject in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing this song.